Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak, coming to you from Waikiki Beach in the beautiful islands of Hawaii. We're stoked to have our guest today, John Martignoni, is joining us. Uh, we're going to talk about his new book, Blue Collar Apologetics. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. You know, I'm, I'm a very fortunate man. I was born Catholic. In fact, earlier, uh, midsummer last year, I got to go out to a very cold place. A lot of the times, Powers Lake, North Dakota, where I was born. And I got to go to the little church there and go to Mass. And they took me behind the back and they showed me the little fountain, the little portable fountain that I was baptized in. And so I'm fortunate that I was raised Catholic, and I loved the way I went to uh, Catholic school when I was real little. I just loved the nuns there, and I was always excited for catechism class. And uh, and then, but I always kind of wonder, why don't I get to, I want to not just know about God, I want to know Him. And I uh, moved from, from Dakotas when I was just a little baby, and then, then to California, raised there as a surfer kind of guy. And then we moved to Texas where I learned to uh, learned about Southern Baptists, and I would go to a Southern Baptist church sometimes, and with my the, my girlfriend at the time, and and I went to this beautiful university, Baylor University, which is like kind of like the Notre Dame of Southern Baptists, and I found so many beautiful people there who really knew the Lord, and were really strong Christians, and then we had to take Bible classes, and my professors, I thought of them. This is before there was an Indiana Jones, but I thought of them like that because they, they had traveled and they'd gone to archaeological digs and they spoke m many languages, and it just fascinated me. And so I just love people who love Scripture, and I just really love my, uh, my Southern Baptist uh, uh, Protestant friends. Uh, but it was at, at my time at Baylor when, when they, be, they brought my Protestant friends were praying for me, Oh, Lord, just get a hold of this Catholic guy and you know, help him. Uh, and, and honestly, I needed prayers because I was adrift and I was kind of abandoned by the faith in a way. My local Catholic church, when I'd go and talk to the young priest there, he was talking about Buddha or something, you know. And so I was a bit adrift and they prayed for me. But I was so fortunate that uh, one summer uh, on my junior year, my mom said, hey, if you come to me, come with me to uh, this Catholic charismatic prayer meeting, I'll buy you a pair of blue jeans. And there's a couple of cute girls there, too. So I showed up and I experienced this wonderful infusion of God's love. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and begin to understand more of that personal relationship side of the Lord that my S Southern Baptist friends had, uh, had, had obviously demonstrated to me. And when I came back from that summer vacation, I kind of blew their minds because I was so on fire with the Lord. And, uh, and, uh, but here I am at a Southern Baptist uh, University, and, they're, at, and they're, they're, kinda, they're challenging me about my Catholic faith, and I didn't even hardly even understand it. And uh, I fell into a couple of the misunderstandings of scripture uh, first of all you know by faith alone are you saved and then um only if it's not in the Bible, you know you, you got to go exactly by the bible you know it's like only the bible uh you don't need the teaching and teaching of tradition and confusions about mary and purgatory and i'm just a young untrained catholic and didn't know what i was doing and i and i didn't even know some of these weren't catholic teachings i just that's what I was being kind of uh, exposed to, and so now we have this brother with us today, John Martignoni. I love the I love uh, uh, the, the the essence of your of your ta of your uh, ministry is this blue collar approach to apologetics, and he's written a beautiful book, co published by EWTN and Sophia. Sophia is my publisher. Uh, blue collar apologetics. So everybody, I hardly even need to introduce him. John Martignoni, thank you for coming to our show. Well, Bear, it's an absolute pleasure to be on with you. So uh, looking forward to the to our time together. Don't you just love our Protestant brothers and sisters, our, especially our Southern Baptists? They love Scripture so much. Absolutely. And, and the other thing I love about them is, you know, I have had times where I have met a Baptist, and within 60 seconds of meeting the Baptist, 
they have told me I'm going to hell. <laughs> yes. Because, yeah, yeah. You know, they, when, you, when you live in Alabama and you move somewhere <laughs> or you start a new job, the, the first questions that a lot of people ask you is, what church do you go to? And so here, you know, I, well, I go to Our Lady of Sorrows. Oh. Oh, you're Catholic. going to hell. You know Catholics <laughs> are going to hell, right? But I tell people, I said, don't be offended by that because what's going on there is, they have a deep and abiding concern for the salvation of my soul. And I appreciate that. And I tell Catholics everywhere I go to talk, I say, we need to have the same concern for people's souls and the same love of Scripture and, 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 and knowledge of Scripture that, that our Baptist brothers and sisters Absolutely. have. Absolutely. I just went back to Baylor, by the way, uh, this summer with my wife. It was one of my class reunions. And I never had so much love uh, and most of them are Southern Baptists, and they love my ministry. I mean, they just love what we do because, you know, we, we stand for truth. We stand for Jesus Christ. And if you're standing with Jesus, Protestants and Catholics, we need to learn to understand each other, and we need to uh, stand together. And the thing about most people who, so many Protestants, especially Southern Baptists, they don't, they, they, they've been told what we believe, and it's not what we believe. And so they're confused about that. And then secondly, uh, there are things that they've been told that we believe, and we do believe that, and they don't understand the scriptural foundation uh, right. and the philosophic foundation behind that. So I just, I, but I, I love, I, I, I remember long ago when, you, when I was exposed to, you know, your work, the blue collar apologetics attitude. I just love the fact that, that it, it don't, you don't have to be a theologian, right, to really understand right. our faith. In fact, I tell people a lot of times, they'll say, hey, do I need to get a master's degree in theology to do apologetics? And a lot of times I'll tell them, I say, well, depending on where you go, that could totally mess up your theology. <laughs> and, and, and no, it would be negative effect on your apologetics. Right. No, that's so true. I, I know uh, my professor at Baylor told us a story about when Jesus ap appeared to three uh, theologians, and he asked them the question that he asked, uh, he asked the uh, his disciples, uh, who do men say that I am? And one one of them said, "You are the charismatic utterance of the sound, of the ground of our being." Uh, <laughs> another one said, "You're the eschatological manifestation of God." You know, the, the, you're the theophany from on high. And Jesus said, "What?" <laughs> exactly. exactly. You, when you get a degree in theology, you start using all these big terms. And, and you know, I tell Cal, I say, you don't need to use those terms. You don't need to know all of that esoteric stuff. So, well, a lot of it is esoteric. And, and you just need to know the basics. And you need to keep it simple and keep it common sense and keep it logical. And that's it. You know, my mom told me that uh, Christianity is an elevator religion. And I said, what do you mean by that? And she said, you can get on the elevator and before you're with someone, and before you get off, you can tell them the basic gospel, which is true. God loves you. He loves you know John three sixteen right. So, so um, but we do need, as Peter said, to have a reason to be able to share uh, the reason for our hope. And so apologetics is so freeing. Uh, I was uh, doing a tandem surfing contest in Cocoa Beach, Florida, and our local Catholic parish sponsored the tandem surfing event. And so they could come down and uh, and they uh, you know they we, they handed out tracks. The local men's group handed out Catholic tracks and awesome. and were sharing the gospel. And our our priest actually came down. He he awarded the trophies to these competitors from around the world. And there's probably I don't know maybe fifteen thousand people on the beach. And wow. from and from and from the from the, uh, <laughs> the the podium, as we call it, you know the awards stage. He said, now first of all, I want to ask how many people out there have. Uh, have snaked someone in the last year, which means to drop in on someone else's wave when they're surfing, cutting them off. And, of course, almost all of the surfers' hands go up, and he goes, <laughs> I absolve you in the name of Jesus. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's yeah. Awesome. But then what happened on the beach, John, is is there was a group of, of Christian, um, uh, the Christian Surfers Association. Uh, one of them came up to me and said, you know, I, I, I heard – that there, I know there are some Catholics that are Christians, and in fact, I heard a rumor, uh, pretty by someone who I really trust, that J John Paul II gave his life to the Lord on his deathbed. You know, <laughs> and then, but the, but now this brings up my first, our first topic, uh, because anybody who's, who 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 reads John Paul II, you're you're just, 
he, he, you're just a, a, astounded by his faith. When we come yeah. back, though, I'm going to ask you a question. And what that is is they, they were saying to their people, go along the beach with, these, th with their tracks. And when you ask someone, have you given your life to Jesus? And they say, yes, then go on to the next person. And so they had, uh, you know, because they're saved. And so there is this right. concept within um, some Protestant circles uh, of once saved, always saved. And I want to ask you, you know, what is the Catholic understanding of that? And, uh, and, and what is the Catholic understanding of, of are we saved by faith alone? And so when we get back, John, uh, we'll talk story a bit about that, okay? But the Sounds name of your good. book, Let's have at it. the name of your book, Blue Collar Apologetics, John Martignoni, and it's subtitled How to Explain and Defend Catholic Teaching Using Common Sense, Simple Logic, and the Bible. The Bible helps sometimes. You just hit them over the head with it, right? <laughs> now, I'm Ukrainian. That's how we explain things sometimes. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Now you can journey with other men on the adventure of a lifetime, growing in manly virtue through Bear's Man Cave community in our three-year school of manliness. Join at deepadventure.com. Better yet, you can lead your own sons through the same compelling video, audio, and written content. Can you imagine how much deeper your relationship with your dad could have been and how much more you could have learned and pitfalls you might have avoided if your dad had a tool like this to help to draw you both into a deeper, life-changing discussion. Now you have a trigger that you can pull that will take you into gritty discussions with other men and with your sons at deepadventure.com. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link, or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha and welcome back to the Bear Wastic Adventure. Hey, we got something so cool my friend Pat Gervais and I worked on. It was just like three months of intensive work. We developed a whole new website. And this site uh, is at deepadventure.com. And it has uh, two main elements to it. We have the, a place there for the mama bears who we love, these ferocious women who love and protect their families. And a place for the men uh, called Bear's Man Cave. Now, we've had the man cave for several years, and the man cave is, was was on Facebook, but we thought we got to get off Facebook because our mama bear site actually got canceled there. And so uh, we we have our own uh, community Facebook like site uh, at deepadventure.com for the men for the men who join uh, Bears Man Cave, and we also so that's a place where you kind of we we challenge each other, encourage each other. Every two weeks, we have a Zoom video meet up with the men, but also we have this new thing we did, the Bear School of Manliness. It's so cool. It, it, there's nothing else like it I've ever seen. It's a it's a 36 month cycle on the different areas of manliness that we want to uh, uh, focus on. And and each each month there's different lessons. There's a written lesson from me on that area of manliness. Uh, there's a, a video by uh, uh, by a, a short deep vir virtue video by me, a two minute video. There's a there's a homily by Father Bryce. Long run, he's the cowboy priest. By the way, the whole website is based on my next book, 12 Rules of Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? So it's all cowboy-themed. And uh, my good friend, Daniel DeBoom Markham, he has uh, some two-minute segments. And, and we have a toolbox there for you, how to, how to <clears throat> do a compass assessment of yourself and set new goals in every area. So it's a great place for men to come join with us. And if you have younger men in your home, 
uh, to to bring them there, and uh, they wouldn't par- participate in the man cave, but they can be participating in the school of manliness. You can actually lead your sons through this three-year cycle on manliness. So go to deepadventure.com and check it out. We're really happy with it. We even have one whole section. We have a toolbox with with the liturgy of the hour, the 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 the, the, ca- the, the catechism, the Bible, and we even have in that toolbox uh, uh, a really cool uh, about 40, 50 songs, uh, country country type songs that all uh, talking about the virtues of manliness. Today we ha- and and my new book, by the way, Deep Adventure: The Way of Heroic Virtue. I have to mention that. Okay, has just been republished. But we have with us today John Martignoni. He's a uh, his his approach to to defending the faith, blue collar po- apologetics. Uh, just just printed again by EWTN or just printed by EWTN and Sophie Institute. Uh, John, what do you tell people who say um, that uh, that they've been saved and uh, they don't? Then you know, once saved, always saved. The 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 the, the, uh, uh, the what what kind of concerns does that bring you? And and what is your response to whether well, how true that is? Well, the concern is I, I'll share a, a quick story. Had a friend of mine who who worked with a, a a woman in an oncology unit. She was a nurse, and this woman, the friend, was telling me that this woman's husband had just come in recently and told her, "I want a divorce," just out of the blue. And the woman was like, "And, and they're Baptists. They go to a large Baptist church here in Birmingham." And, and the husband was a deacon at the Baptist church. Ooh, that's scandal. So the woman, yeah. yeah. Well, maybe, maybe not. The okay. woman was, uh, you know, she was trying to work with the husband, say, well, let's go to counseling. What's wrong? With He just rebuffed all of her efforts. And she finally just gave in and said, okay, we'll, we'll get a divorce. Two months after the divorce, he gets married. So now she realizes why he wanted a divorce, because he was having an affair. So she goes to the pastor and points out where in Matthew 19, it says, you know, if you divorce a, a you know, if you're divorce your wife and marry another, you commit adultery. And she says, he should no longer be a deacon in this church. And the pastor said, well, that's not a salvation issue. So it doesn't really matter. Oh, yes. Yeah. Because once saved, always saved. And so it wasn't a salvation issue because he was already saved. And so nothing he did, sinful or otherwise, or, or, or that he didn't do, could could knock him out of that box of being saved. So that's the danger of once saved, always saved, because people will not necessarily repent of their sins. And it's kind of like a, a, a get out of jail free card for mm-hmm. hey. That's exactly you know, the way I say it. Exactly what it is. And, and people say, it. well, you know, if you love the Lord, you won't sin. Well, the thing is, is maybe, maybe not. Mm-hmm. But that temptation is there because we are human beings and we are fallen human beings. Mm -hmm. So why have that temptation at all? And and then if you read scripture, you know, when I once when I first did a once saved, always saved talk, I told people it was the hardest talk I've ever had to prepare because there was so much in scripture that just went completely against once saved, always saved that. As I was going through the scriptures, I was up to 125 verses when I finally said, "Well, I gotta cut this." I'll off. just I'll just read the whole Bible. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which is exactly. part of it, by the way, that you need to read scripture within the co- whole context of scripture, not just exactly. pull something out of the exactly. air. Yeah. So, so the concern is that it could damage somebody's salvation. It could really cause somebody to lose their salvation because, in a once saved, always saved environment. There is no penalty for sin, none. You know, it's you believe or you There's don't. There's no believe. consequence. And the other side yes. of it, the other side of it is that then you'll hear, well, you know, this person, uh, you know, was a pastor of this church. I mean, know oh, this story right here in Hawaii, pastor of a sh- church up on the North Shore, and and uh, he started uh, getting into Eastern religion and and uh, New Age type stuff, and just refuted his, you know, and walked away from. Uh, being an associate pastor of that church and and uh, started living a real not very good lifestyle, and then their response is, well, then he must have never been saved. Right, right, and that's what I was about to get into because the first thing I ask people who believe in once saved, always saved, I'll say, well, do you believe that it's possible to think you're saved but not really be saved? 
And I've asked that question maybe a hundred times or so. Every single time, yes, it's possible to think you're saved, but not really be saved. And I'll look at them straight in the eye and say, so are you saved? And they say, oh yeah, absolutely. I said, well, wouldn't somebody who thinks they're saved, but not really be saved, say the same thing? And they said, well, yeah, I guess so. Mm -hmm. I said, so how do you know you're saved? Oh, I know in my heart. I'm saying, well, wouldn't somebody who thinks they're saved, but not really be saved, say the same thing? And, and I go through that three or four times before they finally realize, you know, there can't be such a thing as absolute assurance of salvation if there's the possibility that I think I'm saved, but I'm really not saved. So that's the first thing. And, and, and the second, I'm sorry, go ahead, John. Oh, well, the second thing is from Scripture. Yeah, you know, I, I like to go almost first and foremost, almost always to John 15, 1 through 6. This is where it talks about Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. And so I'll ask, I ask what I call my setup questions. So I'll ask somebody, I'll say, you know, I'll read that. Jesus is the vine. His disciples are the branches. I said, can you be a branch of the vine of Jesus if you're not saved? And all the time the answer is, well, no, you can't be a part of Jesus if you're not saved. I said, okay, well, then let's read in John 15, 6. It says, if these branches do not bear fruit, what happens to them? They get cut off from the vine. And not only are they cut off in the, from the vine, but it says, if a man does not abide in me, he is cast forth as a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. Well, what do you think that's referring to? And so, you know, it's obvious that somebody who's a branch of the vine, a Christian, saved, according to once saved, always saved, and salvation by faith alone. They can be cut off from the vine if they don't bear good fruit, and they can be tossed into the fire. So... And then I have people look at me and go, well, what that really means is, and then they go to some crazy explanation, but right. the Bible's very clear. Once saved, always saved is not scriptural. And, you know, look look behind me. You know, I've got, you, you love these books too, I'm sure. Yes. There's the, this, the, the early church fathers, the, all the writings here on this side is the ancient commentary by them. You don't see that. That's a no, that, that concept is a rather a novelty. It, it really wasn't purported until about 500 years ago. I mean, you don't see it in any of the writings of the primitive church. We're talking with John Martignoni. Hey, John, before we go on any further, I know you're very busy, but, uh, you know, we have another two segments with you, but, man, I would love to have you back to talk. I'm already oh, ready I, to invite I, you to there, come back. I would love to. Love okay, to. okay. Let's set it up. Let's do it. Well, this is John Martignoni's uh, book, The Blue Collar Apologetics. Hey, look, John, it almost matches my color of my book. Oh, yeah. Let me see. It's something like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Blue we, is a very manly had, color. I think we had the same artist at the same publisher. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, it's blue collar. And, you know, what I like about that is when you think of blue collar, you think mostly about men, you know, wearing that, wearing that, uh, that color and, uh, and that type of rough kind of fabric, you know, because they're in a rough working situation. So this is men, men, real men know their faith. And, it, and there's nothing more manly than a man, the man that than a man that knows his faith and lives his faith. We're talking with John Martignoni. This book is published by EWTN. I guess that's a pretty good endorsement. I guess I, if, I would if, tend to think so. I would guess it is. If it's good enough for Mother Angelica, it's good enough. And, and Teresa Tamio, who I love, did the forward on this book. This is Bear Wozniak. Um, we'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. We're talking with John Martignoni. This is Dan Laboon Markham with another episode of Country Up at the Bishop Markham Ranch in Goldendale, Washington. Fisher Man. The Columbia River Bar, where the mighty Columbia meets the massive Pacific, is no place for wimps to work. There are hundreds of sobering reasons. Over 200 shipwrecks and many more boats met their demise. As to why this boiling cauldron of water is rightly called the Graveyard of the Pacific, my great-grandfather, a stalwart, virtuous man and lay preacher, was one of the pioneering fishermen who came to Owaka, Washington, to strike a rich on salmon in the 1870s, a time when ships were made of wood and men of iron. My ancestors faced this very water in 30-foot sailboats, not unlike those on the Sea of Galilee. Give some understanding as to why Jesus chose commercial fishermen as four of the Twelve Apostles. 
Hardy souls, these men, men of perseverance, willing to take risks to face death and then go at it again. As you may recall, Jesus called James and John the sons of thunder. Having worked on fishing boats, I know a little something about fishermen who thunder. Colorful, raw language, raw emotion, and the sheer force of will. Suffering persecution and the threat of death, those boys stood up for what was right, pushing through the storms of life. It's time for men of the church to heed the call to be men of virtue and perseverance for the sake of righteousness, ever pressing upstream with God's truth as a flow of culture pushes back against what is right, true, just, and good. Be a fisherman. Get on board and grab an oar. This is Dan Laboon Markham at countryup.org on a journey a few miles this side of heaven. Be the kind of man that when he gets out of bed in the morning, the devil says, oh no, he's up. Go to deepadventure.com and invite Bear to speak. Aloha and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We're talking with John Martignoni, the author of Blue Collar Apologetics, but I'm supposed to also tell you about my, the, the Sophie Institute republished my book, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue. And life is meant to be an adventure. Uh, you know, um, we have a, a, our creed in our ministries that the most radical pursuit you can have in life is to abandon yourself to the wild adventure of God's will. And I know our guest, John Martignoni, I could just see by the glint in his eye that he's had, adv- had an adventure in his life. And part of that adventure is turning adversity into adventure. But when you say yes to God, like my desk, over, my, my, my ne- the next desk over that I, that's my, more my working desk, I, ha- I named it after the desk in the White House. It says it's called the Resolute Desk. And beneath that is thy will be done. When you abandon yourself to God's will, like my son Jeremiah, all my sons have surfed big waves, but my son Jeremiah surfed 85-foot surf. When you drop into a wave that big, you're abandoned to that wave and get ready for a wild ride. When you abandon yourself to God's will, the coolest thing about it is you get to see God do stuff. Like at the end of the day, you can say, dude, this most amazing thing happened. And my wife and I call it Holy Spirit Action Plan. And so uh, this is what this is why I love this man, John Martignoni. He, he I, you know, by the way, the name of your the, the name of your ministry, the Bible Christian Society. That sounds like something some temperance woman would be. You know what I mean? You kind of that's a sneaky little thing you did there. I think I think it's a it's not sneaky. Let's call it clever. You threw out a bit. You know, kind of sounds like a Protestant uh, ministry almost. Well, that's when the way I got into public apologetics, I heard a really nasty program on our local evangelical station. And it, uh, nasty is against Catholics. It's very anti-Catholic. It's talking about the Catholic Church. The quote I remember most, the Catholic Church is the end time political religious system that the Antichrist will use to take over the world. Okay? The whore of Babylon. What, yeah. yeah, exactly. And so I wrote a letter to them to complain and I signed the letter John Martinoni. And I thought to myself, I said, you know, <laughs> I don't care who John Martinoni is. I love, the, I love this. I remember this story. Yeah. To... So, so I made up the Bible Christian Society and I signed it John Martinoni, President Bible Christian Society. So I thought that would be a name that would get their attention and mailed it in. So that that's how I that's how the Bible Christian Society came to be. I just love you, man. That's just so perfect. But the thing about that is People don't realize that Catholics actually know more Scripture than most Protestants by far, because if you're going to Mass uh, daily or even just weekly, uh, but if you go to Mass daily and you're praying the Liturgy of the Hours, Liturgy of the Hour, you pretty much go through all of Scripture right. in a three-year cycle. Where And in one single Mass, John, uh, we hear more Scripture than I think an average Southern Baptist church in, in over in two months, because... Uh, because we, we the whole mass is scripture, but people, right. a lot of Catholics don't really have that that uh, that that Bible. They don't pull out the Bible, which I wish yeah, they would. Can't, they can't but, quote book, chapter, and verse, but they know the Bible. Yeah, they know the Bible, right? And I and and by the way, I love Jeff Caven's new that Adventure Bible that Ascension yeah. came out with. I love that. I, I just love that. I've got two of those. I don't know why. 
<laughs> like I got two of these shirts too. <laughs> you got two eyes. You can read one with each eye. But let's talk. Let's talk again then about that about scripture. Um, sola scriptura. I know when I was I was this young Christian, uh, came to the Lord a deeper walk with the Lord through the Catholic Church, but I was not catechized. And so when people at, when I was going to my Southern Baptist. University Baylor, great football school, wins the Sugar Bowl, wins nice. the national championship. I think we have, yeah, great school. Love the the love Southern Baptist, but uh, they said that you know sola scriptura, it's only the Bible. And I, it's really interesting when I meet someone on the airplane about six months ago. Why well, go to a Bible believing church? We only do what the Bible says. But the problem is when Martin Luther and Zwingli and those guys kind of got together. They said the Bible's really easy to understand. Anybody can read it and should apply it to their lives. But my understanding is Wingley and, and Luther got in a big fight about Scripture about two years after they, they broke away from the church. And so it turns out you really do need a teaching authority. I think I want to ask you first that question. What about their, did Jesus leave us with the teaching authority? You know, he was a builder. The only thing we know he built was his church. Did he right. just throw it, throw us out and say just do whatever you want or or what did he did he prepare for there to be a solid foundation of of, of teaching well, I tell people I said look just everybody picking up the bible reading it for themselves and interpreting for themselves what is good doctrine what is bad doctrine is not in the bible it's not scriptural but what does it say in the bible well if you go to acts chapter 8 it talks about Philip and and the Ethiopian eunuch and it says Beautiful, the Ethiopian yeah. eunuch is reading scripture, reading from Isaiah. And Philip ran up to him and says, do you understand what you are reading? What does the eunuch say? Well, of course I do. I, I prayed to the Holy Spirit and I've got it down. No problem. Uh -uh. But the eunuch said, how can I unless someone guides me? And what did Philip do? Who, the Philip, who was inspired by the Holy Spirit, he guided him in his understanding of Scripture. Plus, he got a free that, ride in a chariot. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so that is scriptural. There's places in the Old Testament where they're, they, they've rediscovered the books of the law, and they have all the adults show up, and they read from early morning into the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And it says it, they had everyone who could understand was there listening. So these are people who can understand but then what does it say? It says the, the priest and the Levites guided them and explained the sense of Scripture to them. That is scriptural. And then Scripture itself says there are passages in Scripture, there are parts of Scripture that are difficult to understand. So the Bible tells us that it's difficult to understand in places, not everywhere. You know, you can pick up and read a lot of the Bible and, and come to and easily come to the understanding of what's being said. But there are very important passages where it is difficult to understand what the Bible is saying, and people disagree on what it says Pe within Protestantism. You know, that's why you have right. tens of thousands of denominations, because people are disagreeing about what the Bible says. It's, it's you know, crazy. And, and people, uh, people go, well, I'm a I go to a Bible-believing church, and I think, well, who, who kind of put together the Bible there? Was that who did it? Just, I, I mean, I re really thought when I was 17 or 18 years old, the Bible kind of fell out of the sky one day, you know. Right. But it's just, it's this compendium of books that it was the Catholic Church who discerned which book should be in and which which book should be out. But, you know, one of the greatest things about the Bible is how clearly uh, the word Holy Trinity shows up. And exp and yeah, it explain right. it, 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 it and the expository on the word trinitor Trin yeah so 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 we see the, the the essence of the holy trinity it's just it's the essence of our faith because there's a trinity of three persons that love each other and God is love and He loves us and He created us but you don't but there's nowhere in Scripture where it specifically says that but the early church the primitive church the early church fathers taught that and came to an understanding of who Jesus is all God and all man. And these right. sorts of things are not necessarily clear in the Scripture. So, so we need that teaching authority. Did Jesus leave us with a teaching authority? Yes, he did. I mean, we see, you know, Matthew 16, where he gives Peter the keys. He says, upon this rock, I will build my church. Matthew 18, where he's talking to Peter and the other apostles. And he says, you know, if there's a disagreement between Christians, what do you do? Well, first you go to the guy one-on-one -on -one or, or girl, whoever, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, you, you talk to him. They don't 
hear what you have to say. You take one or two witnesses and you go and talk to them again. If they don't listen to anybody, then you take it to where? The church. And if they don't listen to the church, what do you do? It says you treat them like tax collectors or Gentiles. In other words, you have nothing to do with them. So it shows that the church is the final authority. And then you've got, you know, 1 Timothy 3.15. Paul's telling Timothy, he says, the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. Well, what does the pillar do? It upholds the truth. What is the ground? Well, it's where you have your foundation is built on the ground. Mm -hmm. So the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth because Again, nowhere does the Bible say, hey, if you can read, pick up the Bible and come to your own decisions about what is good doctrine and what is bad doctrine. And I'll tell you what I what I ask people who are sola scriptura believers, and this is in my book, uh, and, and that's what the book is all about. It has all these questions that Catholics can ask instead of being asked. I ask people, I say, you go by the Bible alone, right? Absolutely, the Bible alone. I said, well, do you believe the Gospel of Mark is inspired scripture? And they go, oh, absolutely. Could you tell me book, chapter, and verse where it says the Gospel of Mark is inspired scripture? Where someone named Mark wrote this book and that he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write it. Could you give me book, chapter, and verse? And they just stare at me because there's nowhere in the Bible that tells you that the Gospel of Mark is inspired scripture. So. How do you know? Well, it's like you said earlier. Somebody had to decide authoritatively that the Gospel of Mark and the other books of Scripture are indeed the inspired and errant Word of God. Well, who did that? Well, it was the Catholic Church. It's well, the it only was, church that was, yeah, it was it was it was the bishops of the church. Yes, it was a council yes. that did that. So it was that authority within the the, the church itself that spoke. You yeah, authoritative. Yeah, I, I was in a debate with a Church of Christ preacher one time, and, and it was on sola scriptura. And I said, you know, tell me who wrote the Gospel of Mark. How do you know? He comes back and says, doesn't matter as long as you know it's inspired. I said, well, how do you know it's inspired? And he couldn't answer. So we debated again on the same topic a few months later in a different city. He thought he was ready for me. I asked the same question. He said, we know because of the early, the witness of the early Christians. <laughs> and I said, well, you just lost the debate because the proposition is everything can be answered by the Bible. I said, number one, you didn't answer from the Bible. Number two, I said, do you know what we Catholics call the witness of the early Christians? Tradition. And I said, number three, could you name me some of those early Christians? What were their names? Which church did they belong to? And, and it was just... I had a deacon of the church come up to me after the debate and say, son, I said, yes, sir. He said, our boy didn't really answer your questions, did he? I said, no, sir, he didn't. He oh, said, well, you've given me a lot to think about. I said, well, that's what it's all about. Well, let, let's close this, this segment. We'll, we'll be right back with more John Martignoni, his new book, Blue Collar Apologetics. Um, yeah, I have a really good friend, Bubba Hicks, in uh, Waco, Texas, where I played football with him in high school, and he became a Hall of Famer in uh, at Baylor president of a bank kind of a smart guy he's such a serious golfer and biker that he had he could carry his golf clubs on his motorcycles so <laughs> he's a pretty gnarly guy but his wife is catholic and he's southern baptist and he goes to um this he says yeah i go to the southern baptist bible studies and everybody's kind of well, i think it means this when this scripture says this how does this well i think it means this or i think it means that but he says when i go with my wife to the catholic church it's like this is what the church teaches and he said right. I, want, I always wanted to know about that about and I said, are you asking about the teaching authority? And he goes, yeah, that's it. So I said in the catechism, and he loves it. The Catholic catechism is so rich, and it was what I was lacking when I was a young Christian. They hadn't come out with the new catechism yet. But, I, you know, I teach a, a morning ocean sunrise catechism every morning for about 15 minutes on on my Bear Washington Adventure Facebook page. So I, I, we love we love the, and the teaching authority. And when you go to Israel, there's no uh, there's no carpenters there's not very many carpenters in israel jesus and it was called a tecton he was a builder what did he build it with he built with rocks and who are these rocks it's the early apostles and you and i who are living stones but it's jesus who puts that foundation in the and then then the apostolic succession we're talking with john martin yoni he already made me go over one minute over my time we'll be right back with more of the bear wasnick adventure 
People love our EWTN TV show, Long Ride Home with Bear Wozniak. Thanks to you, the show has won four different tally awards. And now, instead of waiting each week for the next episode to air, you can actually binge watch our show and even share it with your friends when you go to deepadventure.com and join the Mama Bears or the Man Cave. Along with all the other benefits, you get total access to all the seasons of our aired episodes, plus instant access to episodes that won't even air for several months. Long Ride Home with Bear Wastick, a great way to communicate the gospel in a gritty enough way that even tough men will stop and watch at deepadventure.com. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to NotreDameFCU.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. Are you still listening? I thought we warned you to change to an easy listening station. Well, you asked for it. Here is more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. Aloha, this is Bear Wozniak. I'm going to beg you, please go buy my book, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue. Because if, if you buy this book, um, I, then I get to write another one. So it's, it's, a, it's a book about the seven virtues, the four cardinal virtues and the three theological virtues. And it's a way for you to put uh, weight in the back of your pickup truck. You know, I, I, I had this sense in my mind once of a guy driving a black pickup truck, and he's spinning his wheels in the gravel because he doesn't have one of those heavy... Uh, uh, toolboxes in the back of his truck. Well, the virtues are your toolbox. It, get box. it gives you practical ways to grow in your faith by pursuing the virtues. Our guest today is John Martignoni. I'm bringing books up to pick. If you can't see this, if you're watching, if you're watching on on our video podcast now instead of on the radio, you're watching a beautiful image of John Martignoni in his book, Blue Collar Apologetics, totally cl- covering my face. So I it's a, probably the best image you will have this whole show. John, uh, sola fide, by faith alone. Everyone knows that it's only by faith alone that you are saved. Yes, and two <laughs> things, two very important things about this. Number one, I ask people, I say, okay, could you tell me where in the Bible is the phrase, quote, faith alone I know unquote I know where it is yeah yeah I bet you do and they'll say well it's it's right here in, in Romans 3 24 you're saved by faith I said no 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 it doesn't it say, doesn't faith, say alone. faith alone where is so that word alone? alone is missing well it's right here in John 3 16 you know if you believe you're saved. no no it doesn't say believe <laughs> alone where is the phrase faith alone in quotes faith alone and they'll say well I said I'll tell you where I said, it's in one place, one place <laughs> where the central dogma of your faith is in the Bible, and that's James 2.24. I said, you know what? Right before it says faith alone, it says not by, <laughs> not by faith alone. And I said, how do you explain that? Oh, well, that's not talking about the same kind of faith that Paul is talking about. <laughs> really? Where does it say that? <laughs> Uh, well, uh, hmm, uh, well, why do you worship Mary? You know, and oh, they so, change the subject. Yeah, they change the subject. Yeah, right. So, so there's that. But here's the thing, Bear. People don't don't really think about this until a Catholic will make them think about it. Faith alone, inherent in that dogma, is that you are saved by faith and faith alone which means love has nothing at all to do with your salvation. You're not saved by love. So you don't have to love God. You don't have to love your fellow man. None of that. Because you're, it, as long as you have faith, you don't have to have love because the definition of faith alone means faith, period. When I bring that up to people, they go, oh, well, but if you truly have faith, you'll love God. Well, where does it say that in the Bible? You know, and, and, but, but your dogma says faith alone. 
I said, how can you be saved without love? Well, once you're saved, you'll love God. Where does it say that in the Bible? It doesn't. So the thing is, is it's very peculiar to have a dogma that says you can be saved by faith and you don't have to love God or love you. All you have to do is believe that Jesus Christ is God and that he died on the cross for your sins. Which demons and certainly believe. Then the demons believe, exactly, as right. it says in James 2. The other thing I tell them, I said in, in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13, what does it say? It says, so faith, hope, and love abide these three, and, and great. the greatest of these is faith. <laughs> what? What? Wait a minute. Well, it should be faith, because if the greatest thing that can happen to you is to be saved and spend all of eternity in heaven with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the only way to be saved is by faith, then faith should be the greatest thing. But it says love is greater than faith. So how can you tell me you're saved by faith alone and that love has nothing to do with your salvation? The, the, the dogma of faith alone, being saved by faith alone, goes 180 degrees against the Bible. It is totally unscriptural. You know, you, you think about it, too. Martin Luther, I believe he kicked the, the book of James out of the Bible for a while. And then he did. It, he tried to. And then it came yep. back as an appendix, and then gradually it worked its way back into, into the Bible. But, um, yeah, because he didn't like what it said, so he, so he threw it out. But, you know, it's, it's, uh, so then let's, let's turn the tables here. here. Um, and we're going to have you back on again. I want to talk about purgatory and Mary and all, all kinds of other beautiful things. Um, then what does it take? What, must, what, what is the, uh, the, uh, the sotorial teaching? Is that how you say that? To self, what so is the self-theological? Yeah, what, is the, the, what, what must I do to be saved then, John? I tell people, because Catholics are always coming to me saying, the Protestants make it so easy. You know, accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior and you're saved. The Catholics always say, well, the sacraments. Wait a minute, wait they, a minute, wait a minute. Did they say personal Lord and Savior or just per, Savior? Personal Lord and well, Savior. Well, what do you think Lord means? Exactly. <laughs> you got to do the stuff. <laughs> Don't go there, Bear. That's not fair. <laughs> go ahead. But I when I tell you. them, I said, if you want a good one verse explanation of the Catholic teaching on salvation, all you have to do is go to Galatians chapter 5. Verse 6, it says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is of any avail, but faith working through love. That's the Catholic salvation teaching in a nutshell. Faith working through love. What I tell people, I said, look, Catholic and Protestant agree that we are saved by grace alone. You know, Bear, you can't have faith without grace. You can't do good works without grace. You can't breathe without grace, okay? So mm -hmm. we're saved by grace alone. The difference comes in is that Catholics believe the response you have to make to God's gift of grace is a response of faith and works. The Protestants believe all you have to do is have faith. And here's, here's Catholic teaching. We're saved through baptism. And I tell people, I say, there is no better perfect example of salvation by grace alone than infant baptism. The baby can't have faith. The baby can't do any works. He, is saved, he or she is saved by God's grace and God's grace alone. However, as that child grows up and they're, they're saved, they're in a state of grace, we would say. Now what do they have to do? Well, they have to not sin. You know, and they have to do the, the works of mercy, like feeding the hungry and clothing the naked and, and, and so forth and so on. And if they don't do those, then you have sins of omission as well as sins of commission. And if you sin, you separate yourself from the body of Christ. And so we're saved by grace and grace alone. It's a gift God gives us. But Bear, if you get a gift for Christmas and you never open it up, does it do you any good? No, not at all. And I tell people, I said, the best place to go, you know, in, in Matthew 25, it talks about the parable of the talents, right? All three servants are given something that they don't earn by their master, by their Lord. He goes away, comes back, 
What did the first two servants do? They got interest on what they had been given. And what does he say to them? The Lord, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Uh Enter into my rest. Having faith means be faithful. Yes. So they took it. They had faith in their master and they went out and did something with what he had Mm. given them. The third servant did nothing with what he had been given him. So he was kind of like a faith alone guy because he says he believed in his master, but he didn't do anything with that. And so what does the master say? Oh, good job, faith alone. Yeah, that's all you need. Uh Uh-uh. The master, the Lord said, get away from me, you wicked servant, Mm. and tossed him into the outer darkness where there was wailing and gnashing of teeth. So faith alone did not work in that instance, but faith and works all by the grace of God is what got those servants into their master's rest. And you shall know them by their by uh, by their fruit, you know, and yes. Jesus cursed that tree that didn't bear fruit. And the thing that's interesting about that tree, it was I think it was out of season when maybe it wasn't even supposed to be bearing fruit. But he still said you should be bearing fruit because by God's grace, we should be able to go against all against all odds. Uh, John Martignoni. uh one of my favorite authors, Blue Collar Apologetics. I love this guy. I love to hear you when you have conversations with people, too, uh, more directly. And his book, Blue Collar Apologetics, How to Explain and Defend Catholic Teaching Using Common Sense, Simple Logic, and the Bible. And like I said, it doesn't mean, doesn't mean hit them over the head with the Bible. But, but you know, the thing is, is Christ, uh, uh, non-Catholic Christians are often so stunned how well we know our Scripture. And you can tell someone who's been formed uh, well in their faith. And so that's why I encourage people, read this book, read the Catechism. You know, it's, it's meant to be read even in a Lectio Divina way. Spend a little bit of time every day just working your way through the Catechism, you know, uh, and, and get really get grounded in your faith because you have so much to share with people when you do. Uh, John Martignoni has already promised he'll come back, so we'll have him back here in a little while, you know, hopefully in the next month or so. And, um, and so our message to you in Hawaii Aloha means to give breath. And Jesus said, my peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you. And he breathed his Holy Spirit. And so he said to you, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha. Thank you, John. Thanks for listening to the Bear Wasting Adventure. Find more manly conversation at the Bear Wasting Deep Adventure YouTube channel. Subscribe and ring the bell.